high altitudes, the, the temperature is it's quite cold up there and, this, and the grow, growing season is short. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to introduce what the actual definition of heritability is. It is the proportion of the total variation that you see in a population that can be explained by underlying genetic variation. And so he knew, because he had been very, very careful about controlling the environment in which he planted, in which he, he uh, planted these seven individuals, that none of that variation was due to, uh, due to environmental differences. He made sure every plant was treated exactly the same way. You can never do that, of course, um, completely. So he calculated that all of this variation, because remember these are seven different genotypes, all of this variation was due to genetic variation. So it's a heritability of 100%. Meanwhile, at the bottom of the hill or the, the mountain, uh, David Keck went out and planted his seven cuttings from the same genotypes and saw that they, grow very, that they grew very well. And again, there was variation among plants. But he could conclude, because he also controlled the environment very, very carefully, that the heritability was around 100%. So here we have an apparent contradiction. We have two populations that differ, differ substantially in height. They're completely different phenotypically uh, in observable characters. The heritability in both populations is 100%. So shouldn't the population differences then be genetic? If the heritability is 100% and we see these huge differences, the answer is no, of course, because we know that we used exactly the same genotypes in both populations. The populations are genetically identical. So this tells us that um, you cannot use heritability um, to mean, or take heritability to mean the, uh, the degree to which, uh, um, sorry, the, the degree to which a trait is genetic. Now, we forgot about Heise. He went up the mountain, but this time, what he did is he planted his seven cuttings uh, all the way up the side of the mountain. And because the environments are so different this time between individual plants, they grew quite differently. Some happened to be in very good environments, some in very poor environments, and there was a lot more height variation generated by this environmental variance. And so what he saw is that this environmental variance completely clouded out the genetic variance. Sure, there's still the same genetic variation among those seven plants, but it's not visible anymore because it's clouded out. It's, it's uh, overridden by this uh, environmental source of variation, and he found the heritability to be very low. So now we've got the situation where we've got uh, the same genetic populations, one with a heritability of 20%, two with a heritability of 100%, and vastly different, vastly different average sizes in the populations. So clearly heritability uh, has nothing to do with whether a trait is or is not genetic. Now I'm going to move on a little bit to uh, genetic determinism and um, at the molecular genetic level. Advances in, in molecular genetics or uh, genetics over the past 30 or even 50 years has been dramatic and quite astounding actually and this is undeniable. It's taught us a lot about evolution, disease, development, physiology, even behavior. But it's, uh, it's often you hear people say that uh, the relationship, because of this, the hype surrounding this huge success of molecular genetics, even euphoria surrounding uh, molecular genetics, that the relationship, the causal relationship between genes and organisms has been distorted. And this is usually propagated as, a, as the blueprint metaphor, that genes are the blueprint for life. Now, so we're going to look at this blueprint metaphor a little bit. Um, to what extent do genes determine organism? Do genes specify the organism in the same way that a blueprint specifies a building, that an architect specifies a building? Can one, and these are quotes taken from, from, um, from people who actually were involved in the Human Genome Project, can one compute the organism just by knowing the sequence of nucleotides in, in the DNA? Well, the, the blueprint metaphor leads quickly down the slippery slope to the idea that hidden away in this double helix, famous double helix molecule, uh, 
that this, this double helix molecule contains information on who we are and what we can become. And if this metaphor is true, then sequencing the entire three billion bases of the human genome is equivalent to, well, biology's holy grail. In fact, the, the, the sequencing of the human genome was often uh, framed as uh, biology's holy grail, or the quest for the holy grail. In a chapter from a book called The Code of Codes, Walter Gilbert um, entitled his chapter, A Vision of the Grail, and James Watson said he didn't want to miss out on this big project because it will teach us how life works. And here is an ad from a, a manufacturer of molecular genetic uh, tools. And in it they say that someday researchers will fully unravel the genetic mysteries that define human life. Quite a lofty um, expectation. So what I'm going to do now is look at a series of papers from a particular lab that speaks to this issue of the extent to which genes determine organism. And it comes out of Trudy McKay's lab at North Carolina State University. She's actually a Nova Scotian. And in order to, to do these experiments, they had to manipulate the genome extensively. So they couldn't really use humans for this. They used Drosophila, which is fruit flies. And what they wanted to ask was, how many genes are involved in aging? So the, the question they're looking at here is whether aging or, um, or longevity is determined by genes and to what extent. How many genes are involved and where are these genes located on the chromosomes, on the, on the genome? But there was a twist to this experiment. They asked these same questions in a number of different environments. They asked the question of how many genes, where are these genes located? under control conditions, under cold environments, and under hot environments. And these results look a little more complicated than they actually are. All you have to really notice is that along the bottom of this graph is simply location on the genome, so position on the genome. And the peaks represent areas where genes are active or where they're, they're expressed or the effect of the genes. And so you can see that Indeed, there are genes involved in aging, or that influence aging. But you'll also notice, and there were about 17 that they, that they counted here, but you'll also notice that different genes seem to be influence aging in different environments. So, for example, you'll see in the middle panel, the hot environment there, there's a near chromosome 1, near the very left-hand side, there's a gene uh, in the hot environment that has absolutely no influence on aging in the other two environments. There's another gene in the hot environment later on that has no influence in the other two environments. And here's a, a major gene in the bottom panel that has a, a major influence under cold environments and very little influence or none in the other two environments. So what does that tell you about genes determining organism? So this group then went on to do further experiments, and I just added this, <laughs> this uh, figure just now. Um, what they did is they spliced out these, uh, these genes and the, the area of the, on the genome uh, that influence, seemed to influence aging and spliced them in to uh, different genetic backgrounds in flies. So they had different sets of flies with different genetic backgrounds, and they took these genes and asked what influence they had in these different genetic backgrounds. And it turned out the effect of the genes depended strongly on what genetic background they were placed into. So I think now we're better equipped to answer the question, is DNA a blueprint for life? And even theoretically, I think we can say quite safely, that one cannot compute the organism uh, um, from DNA. And you'll notice, if, you, if you're familiar with the old nature versus nurture debate, we haven't even talked about that at all. So these effects are all above and beyond this nature versus nurture influence on, on phenotypic expression. Now the human genome, at least the preliminary version of it, was completed in, 
in, two, in 2001, and there were a few surprises. And the first one was that only about 30,000 genes, um, uh, that the human genome only contained about 30,000 genes, and they were expecting something much higher, like 140,000 or so. And, yeah, and so compared to other organisms, this doesn't seem like a lot of genes either. For example, it's only about twice as many genes as Drosophila, the fruit fly that we just saw, and around the same number of genes as a common weed, Arabidopsis. So Richard Lewinton, when he was asked what the sequencing of the human genome had taught him about being human, he said, well, that we're not much different from vegetables. And of course, he answered this tongue-in-cheek, because what he was really saying was, we shouldn't have been surprised because of the complex way in which genes work. So why is gene action so complex? Why isn't there a gene that causes a trait? I think we have to go back to the idea of natural selection to answer this question. The reason is, natural selection doesn't design genes from the ground up. Uh, genes are the product of the total phenotypic effect, of, of the total effect of genes on phenotypes, including all those messy interactions that I was just describing um, all through evolutionary history and not the other way around. Another misconception is that evolutionary biologists should be able to explain all traits in terms of their adaptive value, because that's our job, right, as evolutionary biologists. But there are perfectly good reasons to, for evolutionary biologists to expect mediocre or even bad designs in nature. I hate to use the word design even. Um, and the reason is that evolution is constrained. It's constrained, of course, by the laws of physics, like everything. Uh, there are genetic constraints. But there are also historical constraints. Natural selection can only operate on what, it, what is already available. Okay, so it, you often hear it, it said that, that evolution tinkers with what's available. And here's a good example, I think, of a historical constraint. <clears throat> Mammals have a nerve that connects the brain to the larynx, <clears throat> and I'm using mine right now, um, and this, you would expect this nerve just to travel down the spinal cord and connect to the larynx. But instead, it goes all the way down to the chest, loops back up around an aortal arch, and then um, connects to the, to the larynx. For, for humans, it's not such a major problem because it only means a few extra centimeters of nerve tissue. In giraffes, though, this means an extra five meters of nerve which doesn't seem like a particularly uh, good design, but it's simply a footprint of uh, mammals' evolutionary past. In fact, this one can be traced back to fish and the innervation of gill arches. And there are other examples, too, of, of evolutionary footprints, so footprints from the past, vestigial parts. Uh, Darwin's point, um, and some people have a little protrusion on their ears, I happen to have only one, uh, and this is a remnant of our ancestors' pointed ears. And the musculature around human ears uh, is also a remnant of, of the ability to turn your ears and to, uh, and to detect sound that way more efficiently. In fact, some people still have that useless ability to, to move their ears. <clears throat> Another example are useless hind limbs that kind of float around in the viscera of, of whales and a number of species of whales. Um, and again, that's a remnant of their past as terrestrial mammals. Another perfectly good reason we shouldn't expect all traits to be adaptations is because environments are continually changing. So here we have changing environments through time. And what is a perfectly good adaptation at one time period might be a maladaptation or maladaptive or might be detrimental in the future. Now, humans can deal with uh, unpredictable environments through diversifying assets or, or through the purchase of insurance, but buying insurance is strange if you think about it because we are expected on average to lose by buying insurance. Otherwise, insurance companies wouldn't even exist. They'd go broke. But we're willing 
to lose a little bit to avoid the risk of losing big time. And this is known as risk aversion or, or bet hedging. Now, humans can make decisions to practice risk aversion strategies, but natural selection can also produce risk aversion strategies or bet hedging strategies. So these characters will also appear not to be very, uh, not to confer an adaptive advantage over the short term, but in fact, survivors through environmental unpredictability will have characteristics that allow survival consistently. Now, a final misconception that I'd like to talk about just, to, just briefly is that between the value of fundamental research compared to applied research. Now, Charles Darwin, when he set out um, on the Beagle and throughout his life, his major goal really was to, to explain life's diversity, and that, of course, is fundamental research by anyone's definition. He had absolutely no idea that the ideas of, of evolution would be instrumental in very applied areas, such as healthcare, agriculture, uh, evolutionary response to climate change, um, forensics, biotechnology, species conservation, and the list goes on. And I think the problem here is not the title fundamental research, I think it's the title applied research. Because, of course, by calling it applied research, it means that fundamental research is not applied. And we've learned time and time again through history that, uh, that applied or applications come predominantly from fundamental research. And, of course, fundamental research um, provides the foundation for future applications and is a major responsibility of universities. And I don't think this is just a semantic issue because I think a lot of people out there are under the impression that universities, at universities, a lot of um, research that's being conducted is not useful. And I think this is a misconception. And I wouldn't want to leave you with the impression that uh, communication of science is, is misleading in general. That would be completely false. There's so many really good uh, science shows out there, communicators of, of science. But I think that it's worth noting that we should be conscious of when metaphor and polarization might lead us astray. Uh, and, <clears throat> and also, it's, it's useful to keep them in mind. It clarifies the ideas that, uh, that Darwin introduced 150 years ago. And I think I'll, I'll stop there and just thank, uh, well, Carleton University for providing a, um, a great atmosphere to do research and CERC for the continual uh, providing of funding for fundamental research, the Canadian Society for Ecology and Evolution for providing uh, our community with a voice, and uh, John Keane for providing some uh, wonderful custom illustrations. Thank you. <laughs>